for this set of recordings and our continued exploration of introduction to GIS here, we're talking about data types and we're exploring a certain data type vector data. Now saying data type is actually really vague. And so I try to do better with it. Uh, maybe data model is a better way to say vector. Uh, or we'll just keep saying data type and be really clear about what kind of type we're talking about. Is that clear? That's not very clear. It's okay. We're going to work through it. We can see some of our different representations of the world here. We've got vector data, points, lines, and areas, or polygons. We've got raster data where everything is just pixels arranged in a grid. We've got a real world representation to a digital model, and we've got ways of managing and working with those models there. Lots of different ways to take the, the world, the universe, and represent it as spatial data. It's all part of that GIS abstraction we've talked about before. So let's see what kind of things we can get in trouble with today. All the videos in the sequence cover these topics, divided up into chunks, keep going along in the Moodle page or through the playlist, and you can see all of this information. Let's clarify type to start. Type is really important to be clear about what we're saying, be clear about what we're referencing to. When we say data type, there are bunches of things we could be referring to. And for those people or learners or practitioners who are precise about these kind of things, that's very good. And it's very good practice and it's very nice to have the kind of precise language so these things aren't confused. However, a lot of uh, the day-to-day -day terminology or the day-to-day -day use or just the functional casualness with which we refer to our knowledge and understanding of GIS and other components means that we are less precise in our language. What type of data is that? Oh, it's a shape file. Could just as easily be answered, oh, it's integer data. Oh, it's a building file. What type of data is that? So you could say stuff like kind, maybe that's just as vague, format, better, structure maybe, all these other words and terms and phrases can help us improve that kind of ambiguity, let's say. So when we say type, we're referring to a few things. It could be the classification of the information stored in the file. It could be the data's nature or distribution, which we could say level or scale instead. What type of data is it? It's normal data, normally distributed. Once again, just as good of an answer as any. It could be the file format for the data. Maybe again, what, what file format is that? Oh, it's a shape file. It's maybe a little bit clearer. So all of this data topology can be pretty complex. And so we are both trying to be more precise when we use our terminology, and we're trying to recognize that someone asking for data type, again, might have a completely different concept of what the answer to that is than you. Just like someone doing GIS might do it differently than you. Uh, in ARC, one of the common places that we encounter this first is with data types in our fields. Every shape file has an attribute table that contains different fields of information. We'll stare at those more throughout these videos and certainly in the next lab as well. Type here refers to the type of data. Are they integers? Are they floating points? Are they text? Are they dates? And there's even more than that. Are they blobs? Are they geometries? So all these different levels, all these different things that can be done. This, of course, gets more complex in a way when we think about all of the fields that could be in all of the, the whole of the attribute table. And then we have all of these different things to consider. There is a data type column. Look at all those types of data in this one shape file, this one building layer. Uh, geometry and text and double and 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 and. 
this gets more, more, yeah, more complex when we think about SQL, structured query language. And we see that SQL has even more data types. MySQL data types. Characters and tiny texts and floats and enums and booleans. So data type can be variant based on whether we're thinking about data itself. And even when we stick with just that definition, we're thinking about data type and data itself. What kind of data do you have? Oh, I have integer data. It's whole numbers. What kind of data do you have? Well, I have float, floating point data. It has decimal points. Right? All of these different things are important to clarify. Well, between ARC and between MySQL and between all the other different databases or softwares out there, there might be even more data types to consider. So that's that's one way of thinking about our data and our data types. Another, another way to interpret that though, comes to levels of measurement. So we have data types, integers, so on and so on, but you could answer, hey, what kind of data do you have? I have nominal data. Oh, that's, that's nice, you have names. So we also have to think about data levels. These levels of measurement demonstrate the different ways that our data can be structured, the different types of information that our data can hold, the different things that we can do with our data. And so when we think of data levels, we're really thinking about four different levels here, starting with nominal data, named data data that has names. What are the states in your shapefile? Well, it's Colorado and Wyoming and Utah names. Nominal data just has names that differentiate each other. What kind of data do you have? Oh, I have nominal data. It's the list of all the animals on the farm. Got a llama, I got a chicken, got a duck. Named variables. They can't be ordered outside of our common sorting mechanisms like alphabetizing, something like that. But they don't have any order in terms of ranking. They have no outside ordering or ranking or intervals or, or anything like that. We can't do math to them. Nominal data is simple, named variables. Step up to ordinal though, and then you have names and an order. You have some kind of continuum on which these variables exist. Likert scale surveys. How much do you agree? with this statement, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, there's a ranking to them, there's an order. So ordinal data has that next level of structure, let's say. Step up from that and you have interval data. It is named and it is ordered and it has a proportional interview between, interval, excuse me, between variables. meaning that the steps between them are the same. In this case, we know that there are consistent differences between the ordered things. These could be classes of responses in a survey. These could be clear uh, rubrics of some kind of organization. Some Likert scale surveys might function this way. Rank your agreement on a scale from one to seven. Well, now I know that there's a 
proportional steps between these. So interval data has some kind of proportional interval between the different steps. Finally, the, the highest level of, of data, or the, the most complex, certainly, is ratio data. It has a name, it has an order, it has a proportional interval, and it can accommodate an absolute zero, meaning we can do all the math to it. If we're thinking about something like elevation, we need a measured and absolute zero that we all agree on before we can make discussions about things like, oh, they're at twice the elevation at this location than at their previous location. Distance is a great example. I'm going 20 miles per hour. You're going 40 miles per hour. You're going twice as fast as me. Ratio data allows us to do all the math we can. Interval data allows us to do some comparison, some comparative math. Ordinal data just gives us orders. Nominal data just gives us names. Data levels are just as important to work with and understand and kind of live in, especially in our GIS world, as data types or, or anything else. What kind of data do you have? Well, I have text data that is nominal, stored in a shape file. Now we're getting somewhere. Just answer with every possible combination. Those data levels, as much as data type or you know integer versus float, anything like that, those data levels functionally tell us how we can display our data, how we should display our data. If we look at these types of color schemes here from Color Brewer, we'll play around with Color Brewer in a second. These lead us to certain displays. So these data types or these data levels lead us to, to certain types of displays. Look at qualitative on here. Qualitative schemes are best suited to representing nominal or categorical data. Nominal data. In this case, we're looking at census, race, or ethnicity. Qualitative schemes do not imply magnitude differences between legend classes, and hues are used to create primary visual differences between classes. There is no ordering or ranking here. They are named categories. Whereas sequential data, for example, are suited to order data that progress from low to high. They have a ranking. They have an order. In that case, it's people per square mile. And we go from low to high. And our colors change from low to high. All of this data understanding, this data functionality, this data use comes into play when we're working with GIS data and showing off, making maps, creating analysis. So the nature of your data matters a ton into how you display your data. What we'll consider in the next video is how your data format, uh -huh, see, I didn't use type, how your data format determines how you display your information.